Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. She, yeah. <laughs> See, now she yells and you laugh and we got it made. <laughs> we got a system going tonight. <laughs> it's harder to do than it is to clap for. But how many of you, some of the hardest, most painful things that you have gone through in your life have ultimately brought you the greatest freedom? Yeah. Now, how could that many of us raise our hands if it wasn't actually a fact and a reality? Now, it's exciting on this side of it. But sometimes when you're going through it, all you can do is just stand. Just stand and, if nothing else, just refuse to give up. I refuse to give up. I'm expecting something good to happen in my life. Now, let's see the rest of that scripture because it ends up really good. No matter if all of this stuff is happening, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the victorious God of my salvation in verse 19. The Lord God is my strength, my personal bravery, my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet and will make me, now watch this, will make me walk, not stand still in terror, but walk and make spiritual progress on my high places of trouble, suffering, and responsibility. I thought those were low places. Didn't you think those were low places? I did. Bummer. <laughs> Not another problem. <laughs> Sometimes I don't understand God's thinking. He says those are high places. <laughs> places of promotion. <laughs> Some of you are about due. <laughs> Amen. And then that whole thing in James 1, that just, boy, you got to be in the right mood to read James 1. I don't know if I'm up for it tonight, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> be wholly joyful when you fall into all kinds of trials and tribulations. <laughs> Knowing that the trying of your faith bringeth out patience, and when patience has had her perfect work, you'll be perfect and entire, lacking in nothing. Well, I want to tell you, my trials brought a lot of things out of me before we got around to patience. And they still do sometimes. <laughs> you know, you get a trial and then it's like... <laughs> and then after a week of figuring out that's not going to do any good, then you finally say, well, I guess we'll just pray and wait on God. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I sure am glad God understands me. Change your thinking about the level of importance that you assign to being accepted and approved by everybody you know. Well, if you don't like me, my day is ruined. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Galatians 1.10, Paul said, if I would have been trying to be popular with people, I would not now be a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If I were trying to be, now, you know, I want everybody to like me. I hope they do, but it's kind of like not ever going to happen. Because statistically, 10% of people will never like you. Even you. as nice as you. See, you might be the nicest thing on the planet, but you might even be too nice for some people. I mean, I'm a little rough, so some people are too nice for me. I'm like, really? <laughs> Come on, is anybody else ever like that? It's like, 
I mean, oh, really? That's why I really believe, because the disciples and the apostles, they were people just like us, and they all had different personalities. And boy, Peter and John were really different. I mean, Peter was an activist, going to go do something, build three tabernacles, get out of the boat, walk on water. And John just said he would lay back on Jesus' breast and say, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. <laughs> See, the reason why that bothers me is it's in the book of John three times that he wrote the book. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I just think Peter was thinking on some days, really. <laughs> so 10% of people are just not going to like you. You might be too bad for them, too loud, too quiet, too nice, too whatever. But, you know. So change your mind about the level of importance you put on what other people think of you and be more concerned about your reputation in heaven. Change your mind about yourself. Oh, yeah, you've got a relationship with yourself. You don't like yourself? Change your mind tonight and decide to like you. You're going to have to put up with you your entire life. Get up every day and try to do your best. And I don't mean like trying in works of the flesh, but set yourself. I mean, every day, I want to please God. Every day, I want to be a good person. I want to walk in love. I, I want to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Man, my heart's right. But every day, I mess up. I have great plans for holding those till I put my feet on the floor and get out of bed. <laughs> don't you? Don't you lay there in the morning and just think about how good you're going to try to be that day, and then you get up and you feel like you left hide in bed and Jekyll got up or something. I don't know. Whichever one was good and whichever one was bad. I don't know who they were. Don't demand perfection out of yourself. Okay, listen, this is something God just gave me this week. You'll be the first to get it. You know, I don't care what we do. We never feel like it's enough. You ever feel like that? You don't pray enough. You don't read enough. You don't walk in love enough. You don't work enough. It's, ne it's never enough. Never enough. And God just spoke to me about three, four days ago. I wrote it in my journal. He said, you're not enough ever, but I'm always more than enough. Yeah. Come on, I, man, what a relief that is. I'll never be enough, but he's always more than enough. I never pray enough. I never read enough. I never walk in enough love. I'm never patient enough. We're never enough, and that's why Jesus came, because he's more than enough. I like that. Even if I did say it, I like it. <laughs> Change your mind about yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Believe good things about yourself. Believe that there's more right with you than wrong with you. Change your mind about people. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I could get along with everybody when nobody was home. <laughs> Anybody else like that? Oh, I was peaceful all day till the people came home. I mean, I sang spiritual worship songs. I, I tell you, I was just the most holy thing. I just felt like I was just floating around on a little glory cloud. And then the first kid that came in the back door and dropped their books, I was like, what is the matter with you? Can't we have any peace in this house? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. So here's the way we need to learn to think. All people are not supposed to be like me. 
<laughs> They're not supposed to want what I want or like what I like. We're all different, created that way by God. And we need each other. We don't do well alone. <laughs> Also realize that you're not supposed to be like anybody else. So give up comparing yourself with other people. Realize that relationships take a lot of effort and you're going to feel like giving up about every other day. <laughs> but if you work through the rough spots, you'll come into a place of real peace. Amen? Amen. Change your mind about money. Mm. Money is not more important than people. You buying a bigger house is not more important than spending time with your kids. Getting that promotion at work is not more important than your marriage. Okay. <laughs> hey, I know what's happening when, when you get quiet. <laughs> I, I got it. I said to Penny last week, I said, do you, do you ever, did you ever, do you ever, or have you ever had many problems with pride? Because, you know, she's the nice lady I told you about. And she said, never did till you started teaching on it. See, we don't know what we have a problem with till somebody starts teaching on it. <laughs> Lastly, change your mind about how you can change. <laughs> it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We do not change by trying and self-effort and rules and regulation we don't even change just by discipline and self-control. All of those things are part of it, but none of it happens without God. We are at a conference where Joyce is sharing the word to thousands of people, and we do this year round. We are so grateful that God gives us this chance to one-on-one -on -one share him with other people. In fact, this is where it all begins. Joyce's teaching that you see on TV starts right here at conferences. So when we see the opportunities that he opens up, we are always amazed. And I want to tell you now about another amazing conference looked much like this, but we had no idea how God was going to use it. You see, in the Netherlands, the Christians there really needed encouragement. And many people just needed to know that God loves them. So when God opened that door for us to take one of these conferences there, we were thrilled. Take a look at some of the amazing things that happened. Ah, the city of Rotterdam, that's the city that we've chosen uh, purposely because of uh, already a growing relationship between the pastors in the city of Rotterdam. There was willingness, they've been praying for eight years. So we had to overcome some obstacles, but you know, it's been amazing to see what the outcome was of the unity. And I personally, I love it because now we can take it to another level and go to other cities and say, talk to the pastors in Rotterdam, see what has been done. I really love it when churches are coming together to praise the Lord. To, we need each other very much. Well, we look at each other and, think, and see the things that uh, aren't the same. And I think we need to look at the things we have to say. Well, we always talk about the body of Christ, you know. <laughs> and a hand cannot uh, be uh, used just by being a hand. You need the arm. So I think it's very clear what that would mean. That would mean that we could actually work together as one body. God began to teach me about his love. God is me gaan leren over zijn liefde. You know, it might sound like a simple little message, but I just want to say loud and clear, God loves you. 
Het lijkt misschien simpel, maar ik wil gewoon heel duidelijk zeggen: God houdt van jou. And I'm not just saying that to a room full of people, but to individuals. Ik zeg dat niet tegen een hele zaal vol met mensen. Ik zeg dat tegen iedereen individueel. Each one of you don't just hear those words, receive that love today. Hoor het niet alleen maar, maar ontvang die liefde van hem. Whatever love your parents did not give you, God can give it to you double. Wat de liefde was die je ouders je misschien niet konden geven, God kan het aan jou geven. God loves you just as much at this moment right now as he ever will in your whole life. God houdt op dit moment net zoveel van je als dat hij wanneer dan ook in je leven gaat doen. And you might be thinking, huh? En misschien denk je wel, huh? Well, won't God love me more if I behave better? Misschien denk je wel, gaat God niet meer van me houden als ik me nou eens een beetje ga gedragen? No. Nee. Because his love is not based on what you and I do, it's Zijn based on who niet, he is. Niet gebaseerd op wat jij en ik doen. Zijn liefde is gebaseerd op wie hij is. It's amazing to see Joyce, but it's not about Joyce, it's about Jesus. And that's the greatest thing I like about Joyce, that she always points to him. I did not expect so many people in such a large place, but it's very, yeah, it's good to be here. God is still important in this country. There are a lot of people here in the Netherlands that live without God. If I look around me, well, there's still hope. Within a short time, you know, we will be the country that reaches out again over the, over the world. And not because we have to, but because we want to. My hope is that everybody meets Jesus. That's really my hope. I wish it could happen like this, but I don't know. But it happened to me, so it can happen to everyone. All the churches independently could not do what happened yesterday, getting 11,000 people together, but because of the unity, this is what happened. They got hope, they uh, were, were happy, they were singing, they were fully excited and uh, ecstatic about what they experienced. To get to what we see on a, on a fairly regular, regular basis, I mean, it is so much the grace and favor of God that goes way beyond our systems, our abilities, who we know, don't know, the finances that we do or don't have. And I mean, I just stand in awe and amazement time and time again when we feel like God's leading us to do something. We start walking down this path and then he just, he just throws his grace all over it. And, and we get to where we're at this weekend and it's just tons and tons of people's lives are changing. Whether it's disaster relief here in Nepal or Bible study encouragement in your inbox, whether it's medical missions helping people with their needs or it's that program you watch every day, your partnership is what makes it possible. So join us today. Call that number right now. Go to the website and join us as we share Christ and love people all over the world. Partnership is simple. Just make a financial commitment of any amount and go with us into the inner cities and around the world. You'll also help make the teaching that you watch every day possible. As a thank you to anyone signing up for convenient automatic giving for the first time, we'd like to send you the devotional Promises for Your Everyday Life. Join us in partnership as we share Christ and love people. Call now, 1-800-727-9673 or go to JoyceMeyer.org. When we take the program, we, we take it into the homes from people, into hospitals, into nursery homes. We take it into, into normal homes where people record it, videotape it, and look it back during daytime hours. They love it, and it's, it's changing lives. Ja, mijn leven loopt gelijk aan het leven van Joyce Meijer, omdat ik ook misbruik ben. En uh, net als haar heb ik ook uh, heel lang de schijn opgehouden uh, heb, naar de mensen om me heen dat het uh, goed met mij ging. Ik deed uh, zondagsschoolwerk en... Uh, ik had drie kinderen, maar niemand wist dat ik uh, s'avonds heel erg aan het huilen was in mijn bed. Want mijn kinderen die uh, groeiden op en omdat hun uh, opgroeiden, kwamen bij mij de herinneringen weer boven. Ja, en ik was ook nog getrouwd met een, uh, uh, met een man, maar dat, ja, het was natuurlijk heel moeilijk omdat we allebei een moeilijk uh, verleden hadden. Op een gegeven moment uh, uh, he, werd hij elke keer zo boos op mij dat ik uh, weggegaan ben, omdat ik me niet meer veilig voelde. En toen ben ik uh, in Rotterdam gaan wonen, alleen met mijn drie kinderen. Mijn baas uh, die misbruikte mij op het werk, maar ook uh, bij mij thuis, want dat was ook mijn buurman. En, mijn, uh, en op een gegeven moment ging hij ook uh, mijn dochter uh, uh, aanranden. Maar ik kon het helemaal niet meer aan. En toen ben ik uh, 
uh, ja, ik kon niet meer slapen. En ik ben toen uiteindelijk in het crisiscentrum terechtgekomen. Omdat die stemmen in mijn hoofd uh, ja, vertelden de verhalen van alle herbelevingen. Nou, toen ben ik bij de professionele hulp terechtgekomen. En uiteindelijk uh, ben ik toen ook opgenomen in een psychiatrische instelling. Want ik wilde eigenlijk, uh, ik was God kwijt, ik voelde me alleen en ik wilde eigenlijk alleen maar dood. Well, I'm uh, 29 years old. Uh, I'm married. The first six months of our marriage were relaxing. I had a job, he had a job. After six months, I got pregnant from Gideon, our eldest son. That was kind of hard. I was really sick, literally. And when I was 36 weeks pregnant, Gideon came four weeks too early. He's disabled. He's four and a half years old, but in his head, he is two and a half, three years old. It was a miracle. I always said it's one of the most greatest gifts God ever gave me. In 2012, I uh, found out that I was pregnant again. When I was 20 weeks pregnant, we got an echography. They told us we get another boy again. I was absolutely amazed, so grateful. At 31 weeks pregnancy, on the evening, it doesn't feel good. My uh, placenta was letting go. And when we came in the hospital, we heard that he died. I can remember a few things from the delivery, but not really much. And then we had a boy, Jonathan, and you have to go arrange a funeral. Instead of uh, cards from the, uh, the birth, you're gonna send cards uh, to invite people to come to the funeral. Maar God liet mij niet los. Want in de slaapkamer naast mij kwam een christenvrouw. En daar ben ik weer teruggekomen bij God. En kort daarna ben ik uh, vrijwilligerswerk gaan doen in de boekenwinkel. En daar leerde ik de boeken van uh, Joyce Meyer kennen. Want strijd in je denken verkochten we heel vaak. Dus ik ben het gaan lezen. En ik ben ook uh, die shows van Enjoying Everyday's Life. En als ik zo'n show had gekeken, dan uh, ging, stapte ik meestal op mijn fiets... En dan ging ik aan God vertellen, al mijn eerlijke gevoelens, dus Heer, ik ben zo bang. Ik weet niet meer wat ik doen moet en ik voel me heel erg alleen. Heer, maar ik weet dat u er bent. Ik leerde dat ik moest gaan vergeven, maar dat vond ik heel moeilijk, omdat ik eigenlijk zo boos was. Maar dan ging ik me ook herinneren wat er in Gods woord staat. Hij gaat het geknakte riet uh, oprichten. Hij, uh, hij gaat alles wat er gebeurd is, gaat hij je teruggeven op een veel mooiere manier. Then I came at a point that my mother told me, go see the seminars of Joyce Meyer on TV. I really felt that God spoke through her to me, right into my, my room here. And it was so amazing, because the things she told me about the people who are chained. And at that moment I realized I'm chained too, but I chain myself. It's not God who's chaining me, I'm the one who's chaining. And I am the one who can remove my chains by giving my worries to God and not try to iron my problems on my own. And that's how I pull the chains off. Het hele grote verschil zit erin dat ik uh, eerst alleen maar bang was. Ik was bang om alleen te zijn, maar ook bang om met mensen om te gaan. Dat ze zouden merken dat, dat ik niet lekker was. Maar nu uh, vind ik het heerlijk om alleen te zijn en vind ik het ook heerlijk om met mensen om te gaan. En ik schaam me geen moment meer. I'm still right. Right on, not depressed, nothing. Putting your faith in God is the most important thing to do, because if you do that, you can handle the whole world, you can climb mountains. I've seen the, the change in lives, big time. So I would say, keep on giving. You don't give it to the Joseph Meyer ministry, but you give it to the Lord. Those people being faithful, being faithful means doing it by faith. You know, they're actually literally doing it without being able to tangibly participate in the rewards of that. I mean, that is what faith is. And there are millions of those people all over the globe that trust mom and the gift in mom enough to be able to help sow those seeds on a monthly basis and trust us to go win the world with that. Because our lives cannot change until we learn how to think the way God thinks. Right now we're in Paris, France. And you know what, it's so exciting to have the opportunity today through media to spread the gospel literally all over the world. 
We do have a program on the internet here in Paris that is watched by one and a half million people monthly. But you know what? We can't do it without you. Would you prayerfully consider becoming a partner with Joyce Meyer Ministries? Partnership is simple. Just make a financial commitment of any amount and go with us into the inner cities and around the world. You'll also help make the teaching that you watch every day possible. As a thank you to anyone signing up for convenient automatic giving for the first time, we'd like to send you the devotional Promises for Your Everyday Life. Join us in partnership as we share Christ and love people. Call now, 1-800-727-9673 or go to JoyceMeyer.org. Get your free subscription to Enjoying Everyday Life magazine today at JoyceMeyer.org. You mean more to us at Joyce Meyer Ministries than you may ever know. We appreciate you, and we thank our friends and partners for making this worldwide ministry possible. Together, we're feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and presenting the gospel to the nations. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org today to share your prayer requests. Find out more about our resources, see Joyce's conference schedule, and to join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. Well, I've written a book called The Mind Connection. And it's actually about how our thoughts are connected to everything else in our life. You know, our thoughts turn into our words and our words turn into our attitudes and our, our thoughts and words turn into our behavior. And so we really need to realize that all of our relationships, our outlook on light, life, our relationship with God, everything really begins in our thought life. And a lot of people think that they can't do anything about what they think, but that's absolutely not true. We can choose what we want to think, and we're to learn the Word of God and learn to think according to the Word of God. I often tell people, if you want the life that God wants you to have, then you're going to have to learn to think the way that God thinks. And so this is an encouragement that you can have the life that you want to have. That's one of the chapters in the book. It's actually the first chapter. You can have the life that you've always wanted to have. And the way you can do that is by changing your outlook on life, the way you think about life. You know, a lot of times we, uh, we feel like that we can't do anything about life and we can't always do anything about the circumstances in our life, but we can do something about the way that we decide to look at our lives. And so I want you to begin to see the good things in your life and the opportunities that God has given you. You know, I, I actually love this thought about thinking my own thoughts and how when I think the thoughts that I really want to think that they actually do affect the outcome of my life. I don't know about you, but I think I'm like most people. I want to have a measure of control in my own life. I don't want to feel just like I'm a victim of whatever happens. And this is encouraging to me because I feel like that I can have something to do with the outcome if I will think the way that God wants me to think. So I just want you to be encouraged today that you can think better thoughts than perhaps what you have been thinking. I can do the same thing. And I want to just encourage you that the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Or another translation is, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. That's Proverbs 23, 7. And so really what I always say is, where the mind goes, the man follows. Your life is going to follow along with the thoughts that you think. If you think a lot of negative thoughts, then you're likely to have a negative life. But if you believe and expect and think a lot of positive things, then you're putting yourself in a position where more good things can happen to you than, than what would have happened if you would have been thinking negatively. So take a look at your thoughts. And if they need improvement, 
then start asking God to help you think better things than what you ever have in the past. God bless you. Now, what about the woman in Mark 5 who had what the Bible calls an issue of blood? That means that she was bleeding and she had gone, she had spent all that she had on doctors and was no better at all. Now, I think that would be pretty discouraging. But she heard about Jesus. And maybe somebody brought you tonight and you're just now hearing about Jesus. Or maybe you accidentally run into this program on your TV and you're just now hearing about Jesus. She heard that Jesus was in the neighborhood and the Bible says that she pressed through the great throng of people that surrounded him. Jesus was almost being suffocated with people. How's this woman going to get through? She wouldn't give up. And I love what the Amplified Bible says. She kept saying to herself, <laughs> if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I shall be healed. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I shall be healed. Now, her healing was a physical healing, but there's also emotional healings and spiritual healings and mental healings, healing of relationships. I mean, there's nowhere that we hurt that God can't heal us. And while we're talking about healing, I want to take a moment and do this right now. I felt earlier during the worship that God wanted to heal people tonight that have migraine headaches. And so I kind of thought I forgot, but now I know I didn't forget. I think God wanted me to wait so the TV audience could be included. And so if you've suffered with migraine headaches, I want you to just stand up and I'm going to pray for you tonight. Come on, if you have a problem with migraine headaches, okay. And all of you in the TV audience dare to believe. You say, well, I've taken every kind of medicine. I've done everything imaginable. I mean, I've done everything. Nobody can help me. Well, I'll tell you what. When everything else fails, Jesus can work. And maybe you've been prayed for a thousand times, but I'm going to pray for you again. Amen? And we're going to dare to believe together that you can be healed. And there's probably even people in here right now tonight with, with migraine headache. You know, when you have migraines, I know because I had them for 10 years. When you have migraine headaches, you learn to just keep functioning with them. And you're just used to that pain in the one side of your head if that's where you get it. So we're going to believe God, okay? Father, I thank you tonight that you're still our healer. Jesus, you not only took our sin, but you took our sicknesses. And maybe some people are not even used to this kind of thing. They're not even accustomed to somebody praying for them to be healed. But in your name, Jesus, we take authority over headaches, migraine headaches, cluster headaches. And I pray that pain will leave people's bodies right now and that they will no longer suffer with these migraine headaches. In Jesus' name, amen. Be healed. Amen. All right. Now, it's just that simple. And what we want you to do is write us a little letter or email us and Say, I received my healing. I'm so excited I can hardly stand it. And then be sure you tell somebody else. Amen? Amen. And the next time, you, if, you, if you ever start to get a headache symptom again, you just say, I believe that God is working in my body right now. Amen? Remember, sometimes it takes a little time. Miracles come like that. Healings take some time. So don't give up your faith. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. John 11:40 is one of my favorite scriptures. It's when Jesus was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And in John 11:40 he said, "Only believe and you will see the glory of God." How simple is that? Only believe and you will see the glory of God. You're going to believe something. It might as well be for God to help you. Amen. Amen? All right. Raise your level of expectancy. 
Start expecting more from God than what you ever have before. Right away, somebody says, well, what if I get disappointed? Well, the Bible says that God says, in me, you'll never be disappointed or put to shame. Now, let me explain. That doesn't mean that you're always going to get everything you want. So there may be some temporary setbacks, but in the end, you're going to look back and say, you know what? God knew what he was doing all along. I mean, I've had many, many, many hard times in my life, but I certainly cannot stand here tonight and say that I feel one ounce of disappointment over serving God these last 40 years of my life. Amen. No matter how challenging it is, it's still the best offer that we have. <laughs> Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, for good and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. Isn't that good? Everybody say, God's got a good plan for me. <laughs> now, in Proverbs 15, 15, the Bible says, anxious thoughts and evil forebodings make all of our days miserable. Proverbs 15, 15, all the days of the desponding and the afflicted are made evil by anxious thoughts and evil foreboding. What is an evil foreboding? Well, I didn't know what it was until God had to teach me. Because of all the bad things that had happened to me in my life, and actually when I was a young woman in my 20s, I couldn't ever remember being happy. That's pretty sad. I didn't ever get to be a child. I had my childhood stolen through abuse and fear and alcoholism. And all the things that you go through when you live in the house with somebody that is so dysfunctional. And hurting people hurt people, so, you know, that doesn't excuse my father for what he did, but he was all messed up too. So at least I finally did find out that hating him wasn't going to help me or him. But because of all those years of having a bad experience, I had come to expect another bad experience and another bad experience. Does anybody in the house know what I'm talking about? You have so many bad things happen, so many disappointments, so many tragedy, so much bad news that you just, you're, you just kind of just fearfully wait for the next thing that's going to happen. So one day I was looking in the mirror, putting on my makeup, combing my hair, and I could feel like this pressure in my atmosphere. You know, a lot of things that we put up with for a lot of our life, when we really have a walk with God and the Holy Spirit's working in our life, we begin to notice things and question things that we just put up with before. And so I had had that feeling as long as I could remember, but I never one time asked God what it was. And that morning I was really like frustrated with it and I said, God, what is this? And I heard in my spirit evil forebodings, but I didn't know what that was. And then because God is God, it wasn't very long after that, and I accidentally ran across Proverbs 15, 15. <laughs> All your days <laughs> are made miserable through anxious thoughts and evil forebodings. And I came to realize that the, those evil forebodings were actually a hope that something bad was going to happen. It was like an expectancy that something bad was going to happen. And so I had had so much of that that I was afraid to really believe for something good because I thought I'd just be disappointed again. But I could either step out in faith and try God's way or I could just live in eternal disappointment. So I'm asking you tonight to dare to believe that there's nothing in your life that God can't change. He's not going to do it overnight. I mean, he may, but, you know, that'd be great if he does, but... I, I'm here to preach the gospel, not tell you fairy tales. And I believe the truth is, is that when you hook up with Jesus, your worst day with him will be better than your best day ever was without him. Because no matter what you don't have, you will have him. And no matter what you go through, you won't have to go through it alone. So it's still the best thing 
that we've got. Now, here's why it's so important to be aggressive in expecting something good. And see, the thing I like about hope is you don't have to wait to feel hopeful. You can decide to be hopeful. Every day now I say something good is going to happen to me today. And something good is going to happen through me today. Every day I say something good is going to happen to me today. And you know, I, I expected to get the look that I got. And no, I'm not going to let that just go over your head. Every day you should say, I am expecting something good to happen to me today. Why? Because God is good. Not because you're good, because God is good. But don't stop there. Also say, and I'm expecting something good to happen through me today. Because I don't want to just be blessed. I want to be a blessing to other people because I have found out it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. <laughs> Isaiah 30, 18 is just mm, one of the most yummy scriptures in the Bible. Okay, now are you ready for this? You want to pay attention to this. And therefore the Lord earnestly waits expecting, looking, and longing to be gracious to you, which means to be good to you. God is waiting <laughs> to be good to you. Okay, now listen. Therefore, he lifts himself up that he might have mercy on you and show loving kindness to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are all those who earnestly wait for him, <laughs> who expect and look and long for him, for his grace, for his victory, his favor, his love, his peace, his joy, and his matchless, unbroken companionship. So here, if I can just make this really simple for you, God is waiting, looking, longing to find somebody to be good to. And he can only be good to somebody who's looking and longing and expecting him to be good to them. So if I were you, I'd get up every morning and say, here I am. I don't deserve it, God, but I am expecting something good to happen to me today. Another thing I like to say is I'm expecting good news. I don't know about you, but I just am fed up with bad news. <laughs> I love it if I get a text message and somebody says, I've got good news. Or if somebody calls me and says, I've got good news. We need to share good things with people. And we need to ask God for good news every day. Hey, guess what, Mom? Your kid's getting an A in that class she failed in last year. Hey, guess what? Henry didn't go out and get drunk Friday night. He came home. No offense if your name is Henry. Good news. My gas bill went down. Good news. I got a 20% off discount coupon for that. Didn't even know it was available. We need to make a big deal out of the good stuff. Psalm 27, 13, and 14, David said, what, what, what exclamation mark, what exclamation mark would have become of me had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? Now, you know why I like this? It doesn't say when I die and go to heaven. I'm expecting lots of good things there, and frankly, I can't wait to get there. I think it's going to be really an awesome place. I will be so glad to be rid of my body. <laughs> Calories don't count in heaven. Yeah. Amen. We're talking about having a transformed life. And having a transformed life must be preceded by having a transformed mind. 
If you want to have what God wants you to have, you have to learn to think like God thinks. Amen? And you know, I've got so much teaching on the mind because there's no area that we have more problems with than our mind. Amen? So first you have to learn that you can do your own thinking. And then you need to learn how to recognize when you're not thinking right and how to cast those down and choose something better. But those are all lessons that I really don't have the time to get into tonight. If you don't know anything about these kind of things, I suggest my book, Battlefield of the Mind. It gives you, it lays a really good foundation about these things. Matter of fact, we had a doctor tell us tonight. She didn't tell us, she told Mike. She said, in my medical practice, she's an MD. She said, one of the things I prescribe is Battlefield of the Mind. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> How many even physical problems do we have because we don't think right? Amen? Let me tell you something. I can give myself a really bad headache, and it don't take very long if I just let my mind get full of worry and junk and fear. And... Amen? Surely you're familiar with Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind. So transformation doesn't happen without having transformation in our mind. So if this is all new to you and you're kind of like, Man, I've never heard this before, or I don't know what I think of this. Just start paying attention to what you're thinking. Think about what you're thinking about. <laughs> and the next time you get all down and discouraged, think about what you're thinking about. The next time you want to go rip somebody's head off, think about what you're thinking about. Amen? Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I like to say where the mind goes, the man follows. If you think about a hot fudge sundae long enough, you'll go get one. Your mind went to the ice cream store a long time ago, and your body will get there. <laughs> I mean, am I right? It's amazing to me how I, somebody can say chocolate or ice cream and then you just I just can't stand it <laughs> Romans 8 6 is a really great scripture it says the mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit and it ministers death so I might look at myself, maybe I, maybe I looked at myself 40 years ago and the problems I had, the mess my mind was in, how I felt physically, our finances, my family, my background, and I'm sure that it was very difficult in the beginning for me to look at all that and think about all that and think someday this is all going to be totally, completely changed. You know why? Because if we think with the mind of the flesh, then we think according to sense and reason. It's not reasonable to think that somebody who denied Christ three times could ever be used by God again. And I love blind Bartimaeus. He heard Jesus was passing by, and he cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And you know what the Amplified Bible says? Now, exclamation mark. Now. Now, this is how we are. I've taught on that scripture, I don't know how many times. Taught on it about three weeks ago. Have read the scripture, I don't know how many times. And only last week did I see the word now. Don't ever think that the Bible's going to get older. There's nothing in there. Just because you got it underlined, that don't mean you've seen it all. And they tried to get him to be quiet. 
be quiet, be quiet, calm down. And the Bible says that he cried out all the more, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me now. <laughs> so I'm using that now. David prayed in Psalms, Lord, send prosperity now. <laughs> Do you want God to help you in five years or now? And I think most of us would not even feel right praying like that. Well, I can't demand that God do it now. Well, I'm not demanding, but I'm going to ask. How about now? Now would be good. How many of you think now is good? Okay. I do think sometimes that we just, we're not like, I don't know. You know, we think hope is, well, I, I hope maybe someday, uh, maybe, no, have mercy on me now. <laughs> Heal me now. If you don't get it today, get up again tomorrow. Now. That's an anointed word. The mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Do you know that's the place where most people live? Even though people are born again and love God and go to church, I lived in that area of sense and reason for I don't know how many years. And I was walking in the mind of the flesh. I had the mind of Christ, but I wasn't using that. I was walking in the mind of the flesh. But Romans 8, 6 also says, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Well, if we want our lives to be full of faith, then they must also be full of hope. The two go hand in hand, and we really can't have one without the other. We need to believe that God is working in our lives every day, even if we don't see the results of it yet. Today, as always, we're offering you the Word of God, and I never, ever apologize for that because it's the Word of God that changes us. It's four CDs, four hours of teaching on how to survive change, and I'm sure some of you right now are in the process of some kind of change in your life, Maybe one you chose and maybe one that you didn't invite in at all, but here it is and you have to deal with it. Well, you can survive it and not only survive, you can enjoy your life during those changes. So be sure you take advantage of this offer today. I love God's Word and I encourage you to love God's Word because it not only changes us, but it empowers us to be able to do anything that we need to do in our life. Life is full of change. If we can learn to trust God in times of change and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives during change, we can experience